Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Bowles. I'm the Education and Community Programming Director for La Jolla Music Society. I'm glad you all could be here to kick off our weekend in Paris. I'm sure that some of you were here on Thursday for Dr. Walker's lecture that day. And I'm so glad that she could be back for tonight and she'll be here again on Sunday afternoon. And Dr. Walker is a prof an assistant professor at the University of West Virginia. So take it away. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'll take it. It's a pleasure to be back and it's nice to see some familiar faces from yesterday and some new faces as well. If the concert stage has long been emblematic of the public sphere, the large scale and the professional, its counterpart, the salon, has been perceived as the opposite, private, domestic, and amateur. Music written for and performed in the salon has suffered from the flawed perception that it is trivial and un inconsequential. Take, for example, the Chopin Nocturne on tonight's pro program. Chopin's Nocturnes have that sort of reputation. While music written expressly for the concert hall has been unfairly vaunted as masterful and expert over its salon counterparts. In Paris, however, salons and their hosts were on par with the opera house and the concert hall. Throughout the 19th century, salons were sophisticated, interconnected institutions that shared close personal ties and artistic agendas. Even if the revolution had damaged the salon tradition and its attendant associations with social rank, and financial and cultural wealth. Often hosted by women of the upper classes and noble ranks, salons offered the best of Paris's musicians the opportunity to perform for elite audiences outside of the formal and bureaucratic bounds of the city's subsidized theaters. In the first half of the 19th century, salons were located in homes peppered throughout four of Paris's most fashionable neighborhoods, the Faubourg Saint-Germain, the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, the Marais, and the Chaussée d'Antin. Voguish by day was even more advantageous to be spotted along their streets at night, when the salons were open for musical performance and lively discussion among the literary, artistic, and cultural elite. Hosts of salons ranged from composers to performers to authors to members of the aristocracy. Guests in the middle of the 19th century might have attended the composer Camille Saint-Saëns' weekly gatherings on Mondays, or the singer and composer Pauline Viardot's gatherings on Thursdays. The painter, Gustave Doré, opened the doors of his salon every Sunday during the 1860s, whereas mem members of the intellectual elite at the beginning of the 19th century would have most certainly attended the salon of Madame de Stael, where they would have discussed and disseminated their opposition to Napoleon and his ideologies. These spaces were significant not only for the careers of young composers and for the diffusion of new ideas. Salons also served social and political functions. During the Paris Commune, for example, a bloody two-month period in 1871, numerous saloniers collected donations that would be used to aid the wounded. Other staged concerts, both public and private, for various patriotic and military causes. And though salon spaces may easily be viewed as private by virtue of the simple fact that they were located in private homes and catered to what were often exclusive audiences, there was often a significant cross current between the public and the private spheres. Salons were in essence wildly paradoxical spaces. As an avant-garde yet reclusive milieu that promoted intimate sociability and isolation, lively debate and quiet reflection, the salon was a space that thrived on the irreconcilability of its conflicting characteristics. Neither public nor entirely private, it occupied a peculiar space belonging to neither of these two realms while amalgamating characteristics of both. In a practical sense, salons were well removed from the public gaze. Organizing a salon did not require permits from the police, nor was the financial maintenance of a salon subject to taxes as public spaces would have been. But this limited or even non-existent support from the state was a double-edged sword. While on the one hand, the lack of financial support meant that these enterprises had to be funded on the patron's capital alone, and that usually was no problem. The limited involvement by the state and its subsidized musical institutions increased the visibility and importance of the salon 
as a space that maintained a vested interest in the composition and performance of new works by young composers and the exploration and dissemination of new ideas. The Salon also presents a paradox in terms of gender and its expression in French society. The widespread belief that a woman's activity should remain within the walls of her own house as a mother and wife greatly hindered female access to the public sphere. And while this is not to say that female composers and performers were excluded wholesale from the realm of public music making, it is to make the point that women were still far behind their male counterparts in terms of the ease of accessibility to professional arenas. Take, for example, the fact that women were excluded from submitting entries to the Cri de Rome, the conservatoire's most prestigious prize, until 1903, exactly 100 years after the prize's creation. And the first woman would not be awarded its top prize until 1913. The Salon, however, challenged the prevailing gender divisions. Their music, musicians of all gender identities performed and were received as equals. Women's patronage was arguably the lifeblood of the salon space, as the responsibilities for organizing and hosting these elaborate gatherings were shouldered by and large by women who were, by the end of the 19th century, largely part of the haute bourgeoisie. Let's look at the relationship between the Princesse de Polignac and the great French composer and pedagogue Nadia Boulanger. We might not readily think of Nadia Boulanger as a salon musician. We may instead think first of her as an internationally renowned pedagogue whose students included the likes of Aaron Copland and Igor Stravinsky. We might also remember her work as a composer and a concert pianist. However, her work as a performer and organizer reminds us that the Salon was a crucial artistic space in which tastemakers such as Boulanger could directly influence the musical pipeline from composers' pens to hallowed concert halls. Boulanger was both the capable and discerning salon engineer and the maven of the 20th century concert hall as the first woman to conduct such orchestras as the BBC and Boston symphonies. It was in the salon of Winaretta Singer, the Princess de Polignac, that Boulanger's conducting career blossomed in the early 1930s. Singer was the heiress to the Singer sewing machine fortune, and her marriage to Prince Edmund de Polignac adjoined her name to one of the oldest and most recognizable names in the French aristocracy. The prince and princess, a composer and talented pianist respectively, hosted a salon that was one of the most dynamic and influential salons in the French capital. They were fashionable high society events to which invitations were exclusive and in high demand. At once forward-looking and steeped in tradition, the Polignac Salon embraced the works of composers such as Rameau and J.S. Bach, but it was also a haven for avant-garde composers. The princess commissioned works from such composers as Gabriel Fauré, Eric Satie, Manuel de Falla, and Francis Poulenc, many of which were performed for the first time in her salon under Boulanger's baton. One critic writing in 1936, and known only as Snob, neatly summarized the significance of the Polignac Salon to the Parisian musical world. When he wrote that, attendance at public concerts is not entirely recommended for those who wish at all costs to be known as music lovers. Those who wish to climb the social ladder as society musicians should instead become part of that musical Olympus at the summit of which reigns the Princess Edmond de Polignac. The same can be also said for Marguerite de Saint-Marceau, a Salonier to whom our program tonight is more directly connected. Beginning in 1875, the Saint-Marceau Salon hosted musicians, artists, and men of letters on Friday evenings and held primarily social gatherings on Sundays. Sunday soirees might involve music in one room and conversation in another, but Fridays were set aside specifically for musical performances for invited guests. A member of the upper bourgeoisie and an accomplished musician herself, Madame Saint-Marceau established a prominent salon that came to be the testing grounds for Paris's most elite musicians and artists, including Fauré, Saint-Saëns, Vincent Dondy, Claude Debussy, Maurice Ravel, and the writer Marcel Proust. Described as the bastion of artistic intimacy, her salon was influential for those that would follow. The Princess de Polignac noted the Saint-Marceau salon as a model for her own, but it was also a comfortable laid back atmosphere in which the newest music in Paris could be heard. On a Friday evening, for example, one might enjoy dueling pianos, 
played by the composers Fauré and André Messager, followed quickly by the performance of one of Debussy's or Ravel's newest works. The Saint Marceau Salon brings us to the second part of tonight's theme, the Salon and the Masquerade. At the turn of the 20th century, the Masquerade was a popular theme in salons like that of Madame Saint Marceau. Fascination with the Masquerade, however, went well beyond throwing lavish balls for elegantly masked guests. For the French during the Belle Epoque, the Masquerade alluded to the Fête Galante, a term that refers to the works of the 18th century painter Jean-Antoine Watteau. When in 1717, Watteau presented his painting, L'Embarquement pour Citer, to the Académie Royale des Beaux-Arts, members of the Academy coined the term Fête Galante to categorize the work as there was no existing genre of painting at the time in which to adequately place it. Watteau's painting, much like the later works that would be inspired by it, featured twilight landscapes, often half rural, half urban, that concealed masked suitors dressed as shepherds, shepherdesses, or characters from the Commedia dell'arte, who passed the time chatting, flirting, making music, and dancing. The fete galant was leisure combined with gallantry, and Watteau's work has been interpreted by a large swath of art historians as a visual embodiment of a visceral reaction against the extravagant and pompous splendor of the types of art that were consumed by the monarchy and the nobility. The melange of leisure, gallantry, and social critique was likely one that was quite attractive to saloniers like Madame Saint Marceau, who as a member of the upper bourgeoisie was a Republican herself and also had socialist sympathies. She was in fact quite taken with the idea of the fete galante. Her diaries make explicit reference to the style, the music that was associated with it, and her attendance at and participation in events that took it as their model. By the turn of the century, then the term fete galante was widely used among poets, painters, and writers. For composers like Debussy and poets like Paul Verlaine and Théodore de Banville, the idea of the fête galante conjured up multiple pasts, real or imagined. While the name Watteau sparked recreations of 18th century life, the images also conjured up references to Greek and Roman antiquity, an ideological detail that was of great importance to the French Republic. The imaginary nature of the paintings coupled seamlessly with observations of modern life. And much like the salons in which they found so much popularity, the paintings and the very idea of the fete galant itself straddled the line between the public and the private spheres. The public parks depicted in the paintings, you can see the, the statuary here, functioned simultaneously as private, exclusive, and interiorized spaces for the masquerade itself. This reading was particularly attractive for poets like Verlaine and Bonvie and composers like Debussy, who saw in Watteau a retreat from the industrialized present into a pastoral notion of the past. Composers like Debussy, who frequented Madame saint Marceau's salon, likewise took great interest in recreating the fete galant in their music. In 1903, Debussy expressed his appreciation for Watteau when he exclaimed that, quote, now the glorious sun illuminates the name of Watteau, and no proud period of painting can forget the greatest, most disturbing genius of the 18th century. And though Debussy was taken with the French musical past, as it was exemplified by Rameau and Couperin, he, like Madame saint Marceau, also found himself drawn to the world of the fête galante. In works that fe featured prominently in fin de siècle salons like the Suite Bergamasque and the Petite Suite, which you'll hear tonight, Debussy conjured up a sound world in which Watteau's paintings came alive. The most frequently heard version of the Petite Suite is the orchestral arrangement, and perhaps you may have heard it in that form before. The piece was, however, written originally for piano duet and was in 1889 performed numerous times in Parisian salons. The first performers, Debussy himself and Jacques Durand, who would later become his publisher, knew well that a successful performance in elite salons would aid the work on its way to critical success. As Durand would later explain, in an attempt to do something to persuade music lovers of the charm of the Petite Suite, it was agreed with Debussy that the two of us should give a performance of it at a Paris salon frequented by the elite among the dictators of fashion. The performance took place and the reception was kind, but no more than that. The first two movements of the suite, En Bateau and Cortege, take their titles from the poet Paul Verlaine's Fête Galante. En Bateau 
is a sonic recapturing of both Verlaine's poetry and Watteau's painting, as we hear the sounds of the boat drifting down a twilight waterway, carrying lovers, characters drawn from mythology and the Commedia dell'arte, ready for Tristan. Debussy employs a traditional Barcarolle rhythm while combining it with occasionally doleful harmonies that evoke the melancholy that closes Verlaine's verse. It is, in fact, desire unfulfilled. to stop there. In the second movement, cortege, the genteel female of the Fete Galant is accompanied by her pet monkey and a page boy who holds the train of her sumptuous dress. The outward, outward playfulness of the text gives way to the quasi-lustful nature of the Fete Galant as her charges surreptitiously and rather voyeuristically peek up her skirt. Debussy's music captures both the stately procession of the noble lady and her party and the erotic undercurrent of the monkey and the page. cortege is the minuet, a dance-like movement that was derived from Debussy's own 1882 song entitled Fête Galant, and we'll hear a little bit of that now, and I will leave it to you to hear later in the minuet the reference from the song. Vocal theme forms the theme of the minuet, which you'll hear in the piano duet version later this evening. Following cortege, but not, is the minuet, which we've already talked about. The mood of both Debussy's melody and its pianistic reinterpretation in the minuet encapsulates what Debussy called musique Louis XIV avec formule de 1882. So uh, music from Louis XIV with styles and themes from 1882. The stately, sumptuous music of the Sun King, coupled with the fin de siècle reinterpretation of the masquerade and the fête galant. The piano suite closes with a lively ballet that, though it was not directly linked to a specific poem or other extra musical narrative, nonetheless captures the melancholic frivolity of the fête galant. Debussy was a frequent guest at the Saint-Marceau Salon, but the interconnected nature of Salon culture meant that composers and Salonnières alike often took influence from other Salons and their patrons across Paris. While Debussy was obviously attracted to the mysterious world of the Fête Galant vis-à-vis -vis Watteau, he was also very much drawn to the erotic side of ancient Greece, due in large part to his friendship with the poet Pierre Louis. Like Debussy, Louise was acquainted with many of the artistic elite of the Belle Epoque and was a prominent figure in salons. He was a favorite guest of Natalie Clifford Barney, an American-born author who hosted an illustrious Parisian salon for writers and artists. For more than 60 years, she hosted international artists at her home at 20 Rue Jacob. 
She was herself an author, and her published writings evince her keen interest in ancient Greek culture. Nowhere was the performance of ancient Greek music more frequent than in the Barney Salon, and nowhere was there more interest in the artistic opportunities offered by Sappho's homoerotic poetry. Barney was a fervent supporter of women's rights, homosexual relationships, and pacifism, but it was their shared interest in the erotic elements of ancient Greece that drew the poet Luis and the Salonia Barney together. Barney read and was deeply moved by Luis's Les Chansons de Bilitis, a collection of poems published in 1895. The poems, written much in the manner of sapphic poetry, outlined in seductive detail three stages of the eponymous woman's romantic life, her childhood and early romantic encounters, later transitions into lesbian relationships, and her later life as a courtesan. Luis's new poems fit perfectly into Barney's salon as he claimed to have translated the poems from the walls of a tomb in Cyprus. They were touted as authentic relics of an ancient utopia that valued lesbian relationships, and they fit, they fit seamlessly into the Belle Epoque's obsession with the past, though in this case, the past referred to an imagined Greek past and not to the fete galant. Imagined in this case is the most accurate way to describe the chanson de Bilitis, for they were just that. The collection was an elaborate literary conceit, fashioned by Luis himself, who had in fact not translated any Greek poetry, but who'd instead created the fictional character of Bilitis and her supposed poetry. Notwithstanding the poem's auspicious beginnings, the collection was a huge success and was instantly popular both within Barney's salon and in the wider artistic world. For Luis and for Barney, ancient Greek culture had come to represent a sort of moral and sexual freedom that stood in opposition to the restrictive and misogynist views on morality that they saw to pervade French culture at the time. Debussy, too, had been enticed by the possibility of turning toward an idealized past whose moral sensibilities were less stringent than those of the present to find inspiration from musical settings. Take, for example, the evening trysts of the Fete Galant and the naughty monkey that inspired part of the Petite Suite. The two artists were friends and corresponded frequently. They met in 1893 and remained close until 1904. In 1897, Debussy wrote to Luis asking his permission to set one of the chansons de Bilitis to music. Luis obliged, and in the end, Debussy set three poems for female voice and piano that you'll hear this evening, though one might rightly argue that such a small selection of source poems from a substantial collection of poetry might obfuscate the dramatic narrative. This, however, is not the case, and the tripartite unfolding of the larger collection's narrative, youthful infatuation, sexual encounters, and an eventual loss of innocence, remains intact throughout Debussy's smaller cycle. Three years later, the two collaborated in a more elaborate fashion when a larger swath of poems from the collection were staged as tableau vivant, living scenes in which recitations of each poem were followed by musical numbers that accompanied female models who held poses suggested by the poem's text. The evening was, according to one reviewer, a private soiree that brought together an elite audience. The salon was a space that straddled these porous boundaries between private soirees and elite audiences. If salons helped propel the likes of Debussy and Faure into the upper echelons of the very public Parisian musical world, public venues such as the Café Concert and the Music Hall, along with their associated dance forums, often found their way into the seemingly private space of the Haute Bourgeois Salon. Francis Poulenc, for example, could be spotted regularly in the Salon of the Princesse de Polignac during the first decades of the 20th century, while Maurice Ravel was a fixture along with Debussy at the Saint-Marceau Salon and at that of Nizia Cert. It was in the Salons of Saint-Marceau and the Princesse de Polignac that Poulenc heard the premieres of many of his works, but it was also at her home that her guests enjoyed some of Poulenc's lighter fare as well, including songs in the same vein as Voyage à Paris on tonight's program. Dizzy with the sounds of the Parisian music hall and sprinkled with inflections of American jazz, these songs explore a different yet equally significant side of the salon. Voyage à Paris takes the style of a valse musette, a style of song and dance that was popular in cafes and bars frequented by the working class. The steps of the dance were simple yet fast paced and they were popular fare in restaurants as they did not require the large space of a public dance hall. We hear in this song something akin to the vocal style of Marie Chevalier, while at the same time the lightheartedness that might have been fe featured in Paris's most elite salons. 
The same can be said for Charles Henning's Boom. Written in 1938, the song expresses a joyous, if not slightly irreverent, joie de vivre that was typical of French popular song of the time, one that often functioned to offset the very real feelings of unrest and instability that accompanied the impending war. Sprinkled with onomatopoetic references throughout, right, unsurprising given its title, the song was immensely popular, so much so that it won its composer the coveted Grand Prix du Disque in 1938. Perhaps it was its lightheartedness that made it so enduringly popular. It remained a mainstay of the repertoire during the occupation, and it was this popularity that made it a successful instrument of propaganda during the war, as numerous writers rewrote the text to celebrate various Allied victories. And here it is, the British bombings. Far from the cryptic melancholy of the Fête Galant, these songs, brimming with wit, bring the popular music hall into the lavish rooms of the Parisian Salon and beyond, even onto the military front. Dance, in the form of the waltz, found another avenue into the Salon by way of Maurice Ravel. Ravel, who often found himself straddling the boundary between the musical past and Paris's musical future, shared Debussy and Poiré's predilections for evoking the past through the use of older dance forms. He was particularly intrigued with the waltz. It was the Viennese waltz of Johann Strauss that held the most appeal for him. According to one of his students, he believed, quote, that all composers really had the desire to succeed in writing a very good waltz. La Valse began life in 1906 as a work with the title Wien, Vienna, but Ravel did not begin serious work on the piece until 1919, when he received a commission from Diaghilev for a new score for the Ballet Russe. Both Ravel and Diaghilev were frequent patrons of the Salon run by Nuria Serre, a Polish-born pianist whose high society guests included the likes of Proust, the painters Monet, Renoir, and Toulouse-Lautrec, who was often the bartender, Debussy, and Stravinsky. It was in this salon that La Valse was first heard in 1920 in its two piano version. Ravel and the French pianist Marcel Mahay were at the pianos, and after what was described as a lackluster performance, Diaghilev was less than impressed. He said of the work that it was, quote, a masterpiece, but it's not a ballet. It's a portrait of a ballet, a painting of a ballet. Ravel, dejected and disgusted, picked up his score and left the salon without so much as a whisper. But perhaps Diaghilev was right. La Valse is not a ballet, but it does represent, as you'll hear tonight, the creation, the exploration, and the ultimate destruction of a well-known dance form. Ravel described the work as a sort of fatalistic spinning. In the wake left by the Great War, numerous critics and commentators were quick to interpret La Valse with all its fatalistic spinning as a metaphor for the state of European civilization in the aftermath of war. For his part, Ravel opposed these sorts of interpretations. But La Valse has never me been merely a waltz or just a collection of waltzes, but rather it was an evocation of a past that Ravel was all too keen to recreate within the space of the Salon. Perhaps it's not the masquerades of the Fête Galant, but maybe it doesn't have to be. If opera and the music hall made its way into the Salon by way of Poulenc, opera too had a place in the Salon. Performers often incorporated excerpts from popular operas into their repertoire, and composers often found in the Salon a testing ground for their newest operatic endeavors. Emmanuel Chaprier, for example, heard the first performance of his unfinished opera Priseis in the Saint Marceau Salon in 1896. The fascination for opera in the Salon was not a new phenomenon. However, salons in the earlier part of the 19th century were rife with performances of the most popular excerpts from the newest productions at the Opera or the Opera Comique. Often performed by singers, instrumentalists also capitalized on the interest in operatic excerpts by crafting fantasies based on tunes selected from well-known operas. Pablo de Sarasate, a Spanish violinist, made his way to Paris from Pamplona at the young age of 12 to study at the Paris Conservatoire. He made his debut as a concert violinist in 1860, and his early career was built on his many performances of opera fantasies. When, in 1875, Georges Bizet's opera Carmen premiered at the Opera Comique, critics were less than pleased, but the opera's popularity outside of France bolstered its reputation at home. Filled with attempts at recreating Spanish couleur locale, the tunes sung by Carmen are based on traditional dance forms, the habanera, the segadilla, that attracted Sarasate's attention. 
The Carmen Fantasy, also on tonight's program then, was born of a desire to combine virtuosic violin technique with the opera's most popular excerpts. And when in 1882 it was rescored with piano accompaniment, it became well sought out for salon performances in which performative virtuosity was almost a requirement for entrance. Tonight, the cross currents between salon and concert hall and present and past are audible. Echoes of the spaces in which saloniers as innovators, mentors, and musical visionaries curated the sounds of Paris for powerful audiences. Salon, concert hall, private, public, present, past. Whether that passes the imaginary soundscape of the masquerading fete galant or the whirling sounds of frenetic waltzes. We might well view tonight's program as audible proof that the interrelationships between these seemingly incompatible dyads found a critical nexus in the work of Parisian salons and their erstwhile saloniers. Thank you.